Good morning and welcome to our webinar today. We're pleased to be a uh, part of this uh, with you today. Uh, my name is Dave Baker. I work for Elucid and our commercial team, and I'm pleased to introduce our two speakers who will be talking with you today. Uh, first, Dr. Todd Valines. Dr. Valines is currently the Chief Medical Officer at Elucid. Dr. Valines is board certified in internal medicine, cardiovascular diseases, CTA, and advanced adult echocardiography. He is a former president of the SCCT and was recently editor-in-chief of the Journal of Cardiovascular Computed Tomography. Dr. Valines has published over 275 peer-reviewed manuscripts, three books, and eight book chapters focusing on cardiovascular imaging, outcomes, and prevention. Prior to his appointment at Elucid, Dr. Valines was medical director at University of Virginia, serving as a distinguished professor of medicine, clinical cardiologist, and researcher focused on cardiovascular imaging and prevention. And prior to his leadership at UVA, Dr. Valines served over 20 years in the United States Armed Services, having achieved the rank of Colonel in the US Army Medical Corps. Thank you for your service and being a part of this webinar today. And first we have Dr. Marish Ferencik. Dr. Ferencik is part of the faculty of Knight Cardiovascular Institute at Oregon Health and Science University where he is an associate professor of medicine, section head of cardiovascular imaging, and director of the cardio-oncology program. Dr. Ferenczyk's research focuses on the effective and efficient use of cardiac CT in the assessment of coronary atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease. He has participated in the evaluation and assessment of cardiac CT in large multi-center clinical trials, with the focus on detection and characterization of high-risk coronary atherosclerosis assessment of coronary calcium and improvement of the diagnostic accuracy of CT for the diagnosis of ACS and prognosis of future cardiovascular events. He has served on the board of directors and executive committee of the SCCT and was an associate editor of the Journal of Cardiovascular Computed Tomography. He currently serves as the vice president and chair of the education committee. Thank you, Dr. Ferencheck, for kicking off the webinar today. Thank you, David, uh, for the kind introduction. And thank you, uh, SCCT, for organizing this uh, webinar, as well as Elucid for sponsoring. And I'm excited to talk on the uh, evolving clinical role of advanced coronary plaque analysis in the clinical practice and research today. Um, let's see, these are my disclosures. So for um, many of us, the most exciting news in the recent guidelines was that CT gets uh, class 1A indication for diagnosis of CAD restratification and guiding treatment decisions. However, for me, the really the most important and exciting news of the guideline is, is this change in the guideline. Traditionally, we saw uh, coronary artery disease is something that's detected either by invasive coronary angiography or stress testing, which was usually hemodynamically significant coronary disease. However, the new guideline defines all non-obstructive and obstructive coronary plaque as coronary artery disease. Why is it important? Well, it's important because it matters. When we looked in PROMISE trials, half of events or slightly half of the events that happened to patients in the follow-up occurred in patients that had mildly abnormal coronary CTA, patients that had non-obstructive coronary disease or non-obstructive plaque. And this is the major discriminator of coronary CTA as compared to stress testing, where mild abnormalities cannot detect this population at all. This results in better accuracy of, uh, of CTA for the discrimination of future cardiovascular events. As you can see in this slide, this is the population of patients that have non-obstructive disease who have higher risk of events. And of course, people who have obstructive, severe obstructive CAD or severely abnormal stress test, they have very high risk. But this is the population that is increased risk that is not traditionally captured. And I borrowed this slide from Jagat Narula and Jim Min showing that tra traditional approach where we have seen patients for ischemia because they have symptoms, then we stress them, then we detected a stenosis, is probably not the right approach. And it's the plaque for the large population at risk that we need to evaluate. When we looked at the coronary CTA images, we looked at coronary plaque types based on our visual assessment. We see calcified, non-calcified, partially calcified plaques. We can see some of these high-risk plaque features based on 
on visual assessment. And this is how we do it in everyday clinical practice. But the big question is, is this enough? Do we need to go further? And hopefully this talk will convince you that we indeed, we need to go further in how we evaluate patients with uh, coronary atherosclerosis. The visual assessment is reflected in current guidelines or, or consensus document. We have a SCCT expert consensus document on coronary CT imaging of atherosclerotic plaque. And in this document, we uh, made a few recommendations. First of all, we emphasized that plaque needs to be reported. So we, we should in the report note it that the plaque is present. We should perform some form of quantification, segment involvement, score, or visual assessment, or if you have calcium score, reporting the calcium score. This is now even more recently reflected in CADRATS 2.0 that was just uh, released and published uh, online in Journal of Cardiovascular Computer Tomography. And while there's still the primary classification by stenosis, the plaque burden subclassification is now mandatory part of the classification of CADRATS categories. And similar to what the expert consensus document says, uh, this recommends is this semi-quantitative or Atkinson score-based assessment of the amount of coronary plaque. So uh, we can detect and quantify plaque visually plus some form of quantitative me measurement. But as we know, we can quantitatively assess plaque. We can get the plaque volume or burden, and we can get further subclassification of plaque. So how did we get it? And I diverse a little bit into the history. And these are uh, work that is now 20 years old. I, I remember this uh, from, this is in fall of 2002, when we had Stefan Achenbach uh, in our group, we did these first, uh, first experiments on XU arteries and models of coronary arteries. And actually, when we started to look at plaque in these ex vivo sort of gold standard histology validated situations, we used quantification. We measured the plaque uh, areas, we plaque uh, lumen volumes. We actually compared Hounds units to the histology measures. We sort of created these artificial small pools of lipids and looked how the lipid size is affected by the, by the size of the lipid and how it's filling the measurements and, and sort of reconstruction parameters. So when we went back and started all this, we did very quantitative measures. Uh, similarly, when then Paul Moravich Horvath came to Boston, he, he created this great model. He really perfected our ex vivo imaging with coronaries, with histology correlation, with intravascular correlation, showing that indeed we can quantify and see even these more detailed plaque classifications as compared to histology, using histology as, as the gold standard. Now, at the same time, uh, our group and others were involved in sort of clinical assessment where we measure the Huntsville units or measure the size of the plaques as compared initially against intravascular ultrasound and showed that we actually can differentiate the plaque types based on the Huntsville units. And from that, the clinical field evolved where uh, software um, was, were prepared, sort of in late 2009-10, the sort of software application came to practical use where multiple vendors came with it, where you could manually segment pretty painstakingly uh, plaques, lumen, and outer vessel boundary. And based on the Hounsville unit measurements, you get classified further uh, characterization of the plaques and sort of define the numbers of Heinz feeling is that correspond to some uh, plaque types. Now, once we had that tool actually in our hands, people, in addition to doing traditional assessment, also started analyzing the data. And of course, it took some time to get the data. So then uh, Marty Adamitsky group uh, and New York House Leiter at the time in, in Munich, they have started this actually in 2008, nine, it was un not until 2019 when they published this paper because it had five-year follow-up. But what they found at that point is that actually when you take these quantitative measurements, so low attenuation plug and total non-calcified volumes, those were actually the best predictors or could increase the value of the prediction of cardiovascular events in fairly good follow-up of five years. And this was sort of additive or inc incremental to segments, stenosis score and calcium score or Mori score, which is sort of semi-quantitative score. 
And really the quantitative measure uh, turns out to be the best predictor of uh, future events. Now, uh, Marty actually has now uh, 10 and a half years of follow-up. This was just uh, published, I think, in the, in the sort of fall, spring of the last year, that this Munich cohort is now followed by almost 1,600 patients, and it persists throughout the more than 10 years of follow-up, the total plaque volume or quantitative sort of advanced analysis plaque provides the best discrimination of future cardiovascular events and is sort of with the likelihood ratio test incremental or provides the best discriminatory capacity total plaque volume and non-calcified plaque volume. This was now confirmed also in randomized trial, now sort of probably one of the largest randomized trials in corner CTA in uh, stable chest pain in Scott Hart. Michelle Williams uh, published this well-known paper where she showed that it is the low CTA attenuation plaque that has the highest or the best predictive value for major adverse cardiovascular events, cardiovascular death and myocardial infarction. And as you know, this is the first trial in the forest, the most important trial that to show that actually randomization to coronary CTA can de lead to decreased myocardial infarction. So what we are observing by CTA and this association has a further important clinical meaning. We can also look at the other side of spectrum. Of course, now we know about the total calcified plaque, total non-calcified plaque, total plaque volume. We of course care for the other side of the spectrum, which is the dense calcification and work from a paradigm trial where we have patients that obtain the first CT scan and then actually had acute coronary events. I, actually, this is iconic, sorry for that. Uh, from iconic, have a follow-up events and we have actually culprit lesions of future events. Alex van Rosendahl and the group showed that type of plaque classification, in this case, based on Hounsville unit measurements, type of plaque classifications can predict what are the events or what are the characteristics of events that lead in the future acute coronary events or culprit plaques. And as you can see, it's an interesting paradox or interesting finding where the low attenuation plaques, either in the necrotic core or fibro fatty plaques based on Hautsfeldian's characterizations, are more often or more frequently seen in future culprit plaques. On the other side of the spectrum, you have very, in quotes, stable plaques with high calcium content, high Hounsfeldian, especially these 1K plaques, very dense plaques that are less likely to cause acute coronary, uh, acute coronary events in the follow-up. We talk about the stable chest pain population, iconic predominantly stable chest pain, uh, Scott Hart. Very recently just published data extend the advanced plaque analysis and the strong predictive value of advanced plaque analysis in acute chest pain population. Rapid CCTA plaque uh, assessment just shown by group from, um, from Scotland that despite the fact that unfortunately the overall trial was not positive for us, it was again the plaque burden that was predicting who's gonna have events, cardiovascular death or myocardial infarction. And as you can see in these survival plots, it's total plaque burden. Uh, so they sort of dichotomized high versus low, low, uh, high non-calcified plaque burden and high low attenuation plaque burden. So quantitative measures of plaques that predict better or increased, show the increased risk of future cardiovascular events in patients that initially presented with pretty high risk population. In that population, uh, two thirds of patients actually were clinically diagnosed with acute coronary syndrome. Uh, over half underwent invasive coronary angiography. So fairly sick or ill, um, high-risk population. And even in this population with high, you know, quite prevalent coronary artery disease, the total plaque, non-calcified plaque, and low attenuation plaque work as the best predictors of future cardiovascular events as shown in this multivariable analysis with sort of pretty high hazard ratio of uh, between two and 10. Another interesting population in which we've seen a success of advanced uh, plaque analysis is in ischemia, the population of patients with one very advanced disease, 
with positive stress testing for moderate or high risk ischemia. So very advanced coronary disease with quite a lot of obstructive coronary disease and you know some value of let's say three vessel disease, very advanced uh, coronary obstructive disease. But we can see that actually total plaque volume is the highest predictor of future cardiovascular events in the ischemia trial, showing that even in this extreme population, still the total plaque burden measured by advanced plaque analysis can help us to predict events. With that, I'm gonna return back a little bit to Iconic and talk a little bit. Iconic again had a baseline CT and you had follow-up and you knew where the acute coronary events happen. And when you look at this population of patient and do at the baseline evaluation of plaques, you can see that detailed analysis of plaque shows the patterns of prediction of future corporate events. And it's again, low attenuation plaques with fibrofetti or necrotic core or combination of them, in addition to stenosis and um, maximal cross-sectional plaque burden, very similar to IVAS data from PROSPECT, for those who remember, that's very similar to PROSPECT. The IVAS large, IVAS study from Greg Stone, where minimal luminal area, plaque burden, and presence of uh, or tick far by intravascular ultrasound, so plaques that have probably large uh, cholesterol burdens. Those very, very similarly uh, as compared to CTA uh, uh, predictive of future cardiovascular events, sort of corroborating these findings by showing us that the non-invasive method by advanced plaque analysis can get us to where actually very extensive and expensive evaluation by intravascular ultrasound or intravascular imaging can get us. Another interesting study that shows us the value of advanced plaque analysis paradigm. Paradigm was uh, again characterized by serial imaging. So you have patients that have over two years of follow up where they have CT at the baseline and then have follow up CTA. And both CTAs are analyzed for advanced plaque analysis with plaque quantification. And what you see in this analysis that it is the quantitative plaque burden and presence of high risk plaque that predicts MACE. So you can see these red lines. These are patients that have at the baseline larger plaque burden. So they have total plaque volume of pa pla total plaque burden. Uh, they correlate very well, measure sort of the same thing. And of course, the high risk plaque pred pred predicts sort of also a little bit. So adds a little bit of the prediction. You also can look at the progression in this population. And that's very interesting because you can see that it's not only high plaque burden, but those who actually progress faster over time. So showing that the, in the future, the measurement and changes in the plaque burden or plaque volume or plaque characteristics can help us further characterize the patients that are at the highest risk and perhaps need the most intense therapies. Very important clinical insights uh, for our future studies and for our future clinical care. In Paradigm, when you do the machine learning model and you look actually, what are the predictors that are the mostly contributing to our predictive value? And you put in clinical factors in the sort of yellow orange, you put some of the stenotic uh, parameters, just as minimal um, um, and, and high risk plaque features like stenosis and the high risk plaque features. And then you have the quantitative assessment. And when you put all that into the machine learning model, you can see that it's the advanced plaque analysis with quantitative plaque assessment, overall total plaque volume, ethroma volume, uh, subcomponents with the fibrofetti uh, plaque volume. You can see that these quantitative measures have the strongest ability to predict of what happens in the patient with the patients in the follow-up. Another area where the quantitative imaging of plaque has value is looking for the plaque progression in relations to the treatment. And these are data again from the paradigm showing that when you look at the composition of plaques, that's where you actually get information about the effect of the therapies in this particular uh, case about statins. And what you can see is that while the, uh, the plaque volume of the low attenuation plaque of fiber fatty plaques, so the plaques that have lower Hounsfield in it, is decreasing when you are on statin. It's the high density of 1K, very high density plaques that are progressing, showing that the statin treatments 
are predominantly working by changing the compositions of the plaques. Again, very consistent with extensive intravascular ultrasound literature that has been published over the last decade, showing that the primary effect of statins is not necessarily on the decreasing the progression or you know, maybe a little bit slowing the progression, but dramatically changes the composition of plaques. And there, this is probably the mechanism by which the treatment with statin changed the prognosis of the patient. And a quantitative assessment of plaque is what you can use to assess this effect. I find this study really very nice and fascinating. Uh, this is a study, very small study, that shows the effect of lifestyle changes on the plaque. And this is a, uh, people that were on optimal medical therapy, and then they had dietary and increased uh, exercise sort of intervention that were followed over time. And similar to what we see in, in the sort of the statin data, we, we can see that the plaque when you are in the intervention, changes in the composition. And you can probably really stop the progression of atherosclerosis. The plaques will progress once it's there, but you can change what is the composition of the plaque. And that's the only way you can detect this and you can monitor is by quantitative plaque assessment. And the CT, of course, is the only non-invasive way to get there. So when I sort of summarize this, the quantitative plaque assessment has a, a very strong data. Uh, I think it's probably the best predictor of future cardiovascular events. It's probably additive to stenosis, calcium score, and just regular qualitative plaque assessment. Um, it is associated with future culprit lesions, so you can find the plaques that are at higher risk of future events, uh, potentially leading to even some kind of local treatment. Uh, predicts plaque progression, uh, therefore, you know, detects patients that are at higher risk and therefore uh, requiring more intense treatments and allows for excellent monitoring of therapeutic responses, especially through its ability to detect and characterize the change in plaque composition. Now, uh, it's, it's great, but it's probably not the best thing since the sliced bread. We do have some challenges and I want to uh, sort of emphasize some of those. So first of all, uh, and these are, again, so a little bit of a historical, uh, historical view from uh, Szilard Wars's data showing that, you know, when we correlate our measurements of quantification, non-calcified, percent non-calcified, calcified plaque volumes, we have decent correlation with intravascular methods using as a gold standard of reference. But we, you know, especially calcified plaque, we overestimated quite a lot. Even non-calcified plaque has sort of quite wide limits of agreement. So we certainly have room for improvement of our ability to measure what we measure uh, with uh, advances in technology. We also have troubles or is issues with inter-observer, intra-observer, and inter-scan variability. And this was really a really nice study from NIH with Rolf Simons working where they actually scanned the patients twice. And there's some of the patients they scanned on the same scanner, and some of them they scanned first on Canon and then follow up on Siemens scanner. And they show that when you look at inter-reader, inter-reader uh, uh, correlations, the data are, are pretty good. Um, but once you go to a different scanner, so even with similar setting, different scanners, especially for non calcified plaque, your interscan variability starts increasing. So showing that we have some room for standardization, optimization of our, you know, on the society level, how we measure plaques, how we sort of even build the machines so we get the same results. And it has, you know, they sort of modeled what effect it's going to be on the studies. So if you go to studies and you would look, look, I get the change in the plaque characteristics and plaque volumes. Well, if you use different scanners, you have much more variability and you will need a larger number of patients to show the difference. Now, one of the answers to these problems is improvements in AI and machine and deep learning. And I picked out of really large, in, you know, large literature that's coming, has come in the last two years. This is the recent paper from the Mini Days group showing large validation of these deep learning algorithms using multiple cohorts. As you can see, quite a large number of patients showing that with the deep learning method, you can pretty quickly, uh, pretty accurately measure the plaque quantified measures. They, you know, they use multiple 
uh, types of quantification, total non-calcified, low attenuation plaque, plaque burden, plaque volumes, and show very good correlation when you compare it to manual expert reader, but much faster, and as compared to intravascular ultrasound. But what was most importantly is they also show that this predict future myocardial infarctions taking data from from Scott Hart trial, showing that when you quantify with these deep learning or these automated methods, you actually do similarly to those studies that I showed you, because those studies that I showed you, quite a lot of them had quite a lot of manual measurements. You know, they were done quite painstaking manually. But now they're showing that with these deep learning, much faster algorithms, we can also get the same type of prediction. And that's very encouraging and positive for us. Another challenge is, and we also sort of touch on is the, the variability of the parameters. So parameters that we used for reconstruction, so the kernel, thinner slices, as you can see, affect the Huntsville units, emphasizing the need for Huntsville units independent evaluation of plaque characteristics. Similarly to sort of reconstruction param parameters, the acquisition parameters are also affected. This is the paper that's showing the effect of Hounsfield and its lumen that are driven by KV values and contrast on the size of the plaques that you measure. As you go to higher Hounsfield units, the, the amount of dense calcified plaque goes up. As you go to higher Hounsfield units, your fibrofatty necrotic core plaque goes down. Well, this is going to have effect on your predictive value. And as these authors showed, there is effect of both X-ray energy, so the kilovolts, as well as indirect effect of the luminal uh, enhancement, emphasizing the need for standardization and optimization the way we analyze the plaques. We are also getting new scanners that are fundamentally different, and this has just came out from the photon counting experience in plaque assessment. As you can see, again, the similar to everything else that you have seen, as you change the parameters, you go to thinner slices, your total plaque volume changes. This is the same patients. You see different results when you change the slice of the thickness, you, you, you change the reconstruction kernels, you go from the sharper to, uh, to from the sort of softer to soft, sharper kernels. You see the differences in plaque volume. So those are important things to consider in our future. So we have challenges that we have to, as a, as a group of people interested in CT to address, reproducibility of measurements, we are comparing to gold standard, inter-observe, inter-scan, variability of plaque composition based on Hounsfield units, how can we go and optimize it to get this better and independent of our scan parameters, effect of image quality, scan parameters, and reconstruction parameters, and I showed you, and of course, the contrast enhancement. Now, there are areas that are there from the clinician's perspective, as somebody who you know, sees patients and actually need to get these results and act on them when they are one-on-one -on -one with the patient and are making the shared decision-making in the clinic. There are some things that we as clinicians are asking for those partners in the industry that are going to provide and help us to make this happen. We need automation so we can do it fast, reproducibly and uh, interactively with the visual assessment of the clinical has, uh, clinicians our ability to adjust as needed. We need to get this data in an effective way into our records, so clinically useful and actionable data appearing are in EPIC or whatever type of medical records you use. And then eventually incorporate this in clinical decision uh, and shared decision-making tools so when we have these numbers, we actually use them in clinically meaningful way. The one very important step to get there, which I sort of encourage the community to get, is to get the quantitative normal values. And, and the first step, you know, Jim Min just published it again very recently, looking at these what he called stages of disease based on how they have classical, no, no, typical assessment of, uh, of disease, you know, non obstructive one vessel, two vessel, three vessel disease. And Jim, in this sort of relatively diseased population, defined what he called uh, sort of stages, severity stages, coronary disease based on quantitative amount of total plaque. Now, what is really my hope is that now when we have both the Miami Heart that has over 2,000 patients that are normal asymptomatic and even larger SCAPI study, that we now have these qualitative assessment of plaques. We, we see what is the distribution of plaques in these populations. 
I hope that in the next three years, we will have full quantitative assessment of stock relations, and we will be able to get the normal values as we have them for Atkinson score for calcium. Finally, there is a, the most important step at the end, and that's the reimbursement. And I'm excited that we do have sort of looks like path forward. There is a new CPT code, and there's a sort of pretty rapid movement in this area. Uh, leading to hopefully reimbursement of the service for our, uh, for our medical systems and for our patients, it will be the ultimately need that the society, SCCT, and others support so we can provide this service effectively to our patients. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I'm uh, really excited that uh, I think this is going to get very soon to clinical practice. And with that, uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to speak and to you, Todd. All right. Well, terrific, uh, Maros. That was uh, one of the most comprehensive and most well-done summaries of where we are in the field with regards to plaque quantification and plaque characterization that I've heard. And I want to thank Maros and so many who have contributed to this literature, because as many of you who are on the front lines of you have been on the front lines of cardiac CT imaging, I think we've all learned that you know the field has moved beyond stenosis. Um, and so it's exciting. In fact, I think Marosh made it so clear that the strongest predictors of plaque progression, the strongest predictors of patient events um, are things that we're not commonly or even able to measure when we do our local coronary CT reads. And I think that's, that's the real promise and value of both quantifying and characterizing plaque to improve what we're giving back to our patients. Um, and I, I think this is an exciting uh, time to be in the field of cardiac CT. So I'm Todd Valines, uh, I'm Chief Medical Officer at Elucid. I'm a professor of medicine at the University of Virginia and past president of the SCCT and uh, past editor-in-chief of the JCCT. And I'm really excited to kind of shift gears to talk about one of those software solutions that, I, that, that, is, that is available and some exciting uh, literature in this area. Uh, um, and as Marosh mentioned, you know, that this is kind of the, 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 the time of plaque, if you will. You heard the redefinition of coronary artery disease in this 2021 multi-societal guideline. The, the, the use of anatomic imaging to redefine how we both diagnose patients with coronary disease and manage them. Um, and so the level one recommendations for both acute and chronic chest pain, as well as the inclusion for the first time in guidelines of FFRCT. So an exciting time. And the, and the world of plaque, as you heard, with it, it is something that now I think we're all with this new CADRETS document, you know, all, all on the practice of cardiac CT, we've seen this new emphasis there's a new plaque score, as you saw within the CADRADS document. We know within the SECT, multi uh, the SECT consensus statement, there, there's been an emphasis on plaque with a recognition that is, in fact, the strongest predictor of events is, in fact, plaque above and beyond stenosis. And so this is something I think you're all aware of if you're on this, on this call. But what you just heard is, in fact, the ability to quantify plaque is the most powerful predictive marker in most, in almost all studies that we've seen, quantify and characterize. And you can see the way that we do this in CAD REDS too. But the question, of course, is can we do better than dichotomously labeling patients, whether you have any high risk plaque versus not? And I think you just saw some ev the evidence from Mars that we actually, with plaque quantification and characterization software, have that opportunity. Now. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Lucid product and show how this is different from some of the software you may have heard of, may have been aware of, and many of the studies that you just saw. You saw some of the limitations in using Hounsfield units alone to characterize plaque. We know that Hounsfield units are what we see, they're what we measure on CT scans, but when we bucket plaque, for example, we say less than 30, or we, we say, you know, you have plaques that are in a, a non-calcified plaque range, we give them labels. The question is, are these thresholds biologically plausible? Do they correlate to a measurable ground truth? And what we've seen is that those values are obviously are very influenced by the contrast density within the lumen, the acquisition brand of the scanner, the type of software that you're using even uh, can influence these. Um, and obviously the KV and MA settings can influence what we use. So the approach that Elucid took was quite different is it asked the question of can we, instead of characterizing simply by Hounsfield units, can software attempt to give back as a result a characterization of plaque that's based on biology? 
things such as that, that a pathologist would see when they look at a slide under a microscope, things such as lipid rich necrotic pore, fibrotic plaque, calcified plaque, or even in some cases, intraplaque hemorrhage. And that was the challenge, and that was the approach taken by Elucid in, in the attempt to overcome some of these limitations, because this approach approach would take into account acquisition parameters, take into account intracoronary uh, Hounsfield unit densities, and these imaging parameters would be a part of this analysis. And we know that, we know that using Hounsfield-based software, for example, this is a small study in JCCT of 20 patients of 149 segments, but there was statistically significant inter-observer variability and very high 95% limits of agreement between and within observers and in between scans. So this was the approach. This is a paper published in 2018 in radiology. It was, a, it was one of the first publications to test this methodology of can, with deep learning approaches, can we train algorithms to actually replicate what a pathologist sees? And so this is the way it was performed. And this was done in conjunction with Ranu Vermani, one of the world's leading cardiovascular pathologists and her, her group at CV Path. And it was felt the best way to start, the fact that, in fact, if you were going to train your models to replicate and predict atherosclerosis based on biology, would be to start with the freshest, highest quality tissue samples. And so they took patients who were undergoing carotid endarterectomy who had just had a CT angiogram. They took these fresh sections, which included both normal and abnormal tissue. They sectioned them every two millimeters. They had pathologists annotate each and every cross-section. This initially started with uh, just a little over 30 patients and 239 cross-sections. This study has since been expanded to thousands and uh, thousands of samples. But they asked the pathologist, annotate on every single slide the tissue characteristics. And let's compare that with very careful, with, with very careful co-registration to the CT scan findings. And let's use this tissue characterization by pathologists to train a deep learning model to actually predict tissue, to predict what a, what a pathologist would see with using the terms that I just described, things like lipid-rich necrotic core, fibrotic plaque, calcified plaque, et cetera. And can we, can we describe plaque this way, adjusting for these differences in acquisition and adjusting for differences in contrast density? And that was the challenge, and that was what was performed. Now, one of the approaches taken using the software was that we know that there is blooming uh, with calcified structures. And so uh, it, as part of the study, what was designed were patented algorithms to mitigate and deblur areas of, of, of high density, density plaques, such as calcified plaque, um, and, and, and to correct for some of this motion that we see. But that if you do that, you see very strong performance. This is showing the current label for Lucid Vivo that has since extended the small feasibility study to show that this is a valid approach and highly accurate. And so this is compared not to expert readers. This is compared not to someone manually measuring Hounsfield units. This is compared to some Ron and Vermont and her group looking at tissue samples and asking, did the CT scan get it right? Could it actually predict the tissue that a pathologist were seeing with high accuracy? And you can see in this analysis now involving thousands and thousands of samples, there's very low bias very strong correlation between the software aided measurements of tissue characteristics and the histological validation. And there was very high levels of reproducibility, re re repeatability, and very low inter-reader variability for classifying tissues into calcified lipid rich necrotic core, interplaque hemorrhage, and fibrotic plaque matrix. This, is, this has subsequently been extended to ask the question of can you actually predict plaque stability using the starry Vermani classification so that when they look at a cross-section of plaque that you actually can predict its, its risk of rupture and stability. And again, using histologic ground truth-based CT analysis using the Elucid software, you can do this with extremely high accuracy across, uh, across anatomic uh, areas. Now the question is, does this translate well to the intracoronary imaging? And this is data just hot off the press that was published or presented by Christos Barantis' group, one of the world's leaders in intracoronary imaging. This was presented at TCT. That showed that when you look at total atheroma volume and percent atheroma volume using the Elucid analysis, that you see very, very high degrees of accuracy or in, in strong correlations between both of these measures of total plaque volume in a heavily diseased coronary 
uh, vessels. This involved 100 patients uh, or 100 vessels analyzed using CT and NIRS IVIS catheter. So very exciting technology. This, tech, this, this uh, software has been used at the NIH. This is uh, Neha Mehta's group in patients. This is a, a, a low prevalence or low coronary disease burden population um, who had psoriatic arthritis who underwent treatment with a biological intervention. And again, seeing the change in lipid rich necrotic core, you heard from Marosh very eloquently how that having baseline quantification can assess response to therapy. And we saw that using the elucid analysis, we could see changes in lipid rich necrotic core. This same population was analyzed using a Hounsfield based software. And due to the noise related to that assessment technique, there was no change that could be detected. Now I'm going to shift gears and we, we've established the analysis of plaque. And how does plaque translate to physiology? And this is a lesson learned we learned from the Credence trial that was published in 2020. That in fact, if you use models based on plaque burden, plaque characterization, that you can predict physiology, that plaque drives ischemia. And this can be, in this model, predicted as well as a, a very different approach using computational fluid dynamics. And so these are the results of uh, a validation study asking that question is if you can accurately characterize plaque in the wall of the vessel, can you predict its vasodilatory capacity and estimate invasive FFR from CT image, images? And this is a multi-center study validation results I'm gonna share with you. This is the study design, extensive model pre-training as I showed you previously, proving that tissue characterization can be done in an accurate way compared to pathology and demonstrating in, in a preclinical way that it in fact, plaque gets a say in the vasodilatory response to a vessel. That it's simply not, that, that, in, that estimating FFR from CT is simply not based on lumen volume and mass of myocardium. A plaque gets a say. And in fact, in the way this was performed, as with, as with many deep learning studies, there was a training data set and a validation data set. The training data set were 407 vessels from three sites with invasive, with F FFR data. And then this was, put to the test, if you will, in a validation data set involving 337 vessels and 302 patients, comparing it to invasive FFR as the gold standard. And so this question of can we even move beyond plaque quantification and characterization to use this as a measure of vessel health, because plaque gets a say, and we've seen in preclinical work, work you can predict invasive FFR very accurately based on plaque characteristics, not using computational fluid dynamics. And th these are the results of this study, this five-site this, this five multicenter international clinical study of 302 patients involving uh, 337 vessels. You can see a per, uh, you know, per vessel sensitivity of 0.85, specificity of 0.87, accuracy of 0.86, very high-level performance. And it's this, it's this, it's these data that have been submitted to the FDA, and uh, we'll be excited to hopefully share the, with you the results of that in the near future, and to see this in the published literature. And this is just showing you why I think a plaque-based measure of physiology deriving FFRCT from the degree of atherosclerosis, the characterization of that atherosclerosis, we think is a very interpretable way of of understanding changes in FFR along the course of a vessel. Um, as shown in this example. We also think that this type of output can help understand why FFR changes and also displaying an integrated, in an integrated way, plaque integrated with physiology will allow it, for example, interventionalists to not just consider changes in pressure across the coronary tree, but most importantly, consider the degree of calcification, the degree of, of, of vessel remodeling and vessel size and planning procedures and providing this in an integrated report so that patients and providers can now not only get physiology, but they can get whole vessel and lesion specific plaque volumes, as well as plaque characterization combined with lesion specific ischemia through plaque based FFR CT. And then lastly, one of the unique features um, of this analysis is given the fact this is done by a single analyst, it can be done in less than 30 minutes, it can be performed on site, which we think is a unique feature related to this technology. And so I'm going to close just by just demonstrating the, to you, or hopefully I've demonstrated you one of the values uh, that goes back to one of the things that Mara said is that if we're going to do this, it should be done well. Having a measurable external gold standard, I think, is of value given the variability of image acquisition on Hounsfield unit measurements. And that to be a true quantitative imaging biomarker, by definition, by definition, there should be a measurable quantitative 
ground truth. And we think that histology actually provides that and accounts for variability in image acquisition and provides the ability to assess both compositional indices that you're used to, you know, used to seeing, but presenting it in a different way, the way you learned in medical school and what pathologists would see under a microscope, but also assessing stenosis, plaque burn, remodeling index, and in the future, assessing plaque stability, but then using that information to derive an estimate of invasive FFR. So why don't I stop there? And we'd love to hear your questions. And uh, again, thanks to Marosh and thanks for the SECT for, for uh, sponsoring this. Um, and we look forward to sharing, hearing your questions. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much. And uh, please feel free to put your comments or your uh, questions in the chat box. Let me start with one that uh, came in on the side here though. Um, I, how does plaque analysis complement my FFRCT analysis? Um, so what I would say is that they are very complementary and, and in symptomatic population, they uh, provide two, um, two areas of sort of clinical information. The FFR is very valuable in de defining the hemodynamic significance of stenosis. And, and you know, we, we also know there's some predictive value of FFR, but really answering the clinician's questions, is this patient that has moderately obstructive coronary disease having symptoms most likely related to their uh, obstructive coronary disease? And, you know, can the in intervention potentially improve the symptoms of this patient? Because we have a lot of data from interventional world in this area. The plaque provides the prognostic information, and I tried to talk about it in my 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 in sort of my summary. Is that this is the strongest prognostic information that we have? Uh, we have it there in the images, and I think we really need this to bring this to the clinical practice. We should use this most accurate predictive information that we have in the images. In order to do so, we need quantification with the advanced analysis. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I think what we've learned is that, um, you know, there's two ways that plaque helps. Number one, obviously, for long-term prognosis, as Maro so beautifully just stated and showed us. But I also think that, you know, in, in, in areas of, of FFRCT gray zone areas, you know, these, this 0.7 to 0.8, I mean, visually getting that data, looking at the, the, the bulky nature, the positive remodeling, the, the plaque characteristics can often, um, I, we, have, we have seen that, you know, plaque is often an arbiter uh, when, when we see patients go to the cath lab. And, it, and it's, those, it's that knowledge of plaque and the extent of disease that often um, is most predictive of having an abnormal FFR in those popu that, that patient population. So I think plaque can help in the arbiter of, of, you know, who do you take to the cath lab in these gray zone cases, obviously can influence therapy. And quite frankly, while FFR can help decide maybe who needs to go to the cath lab or antianginal therapies, you know, if you have a patient who's already on therapy and yet you're seeing lots of lipid rich necrotic core, that patient's not responding to therapy. And, and, and regardless of your decision making for interventions, you know, escalation of preventive therapy, I think, is, 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 is also something that should not be forgotten about. Great. Uh, we had a question here, too, about uh... It, it, it's great that you can now analyze plaque type and plaque volume, but how does that change your treatment uh, plans now that you have this av availability of information? Yeah, it's, uh, so I would answer with first saying we have to acknowledge that we don't have randomized trial data showing that, you know, treatment X or Y would really change the outcomes or even progression of plaque. But we have a lot of observational data that intense statin treatment uh, changes the plaque composition in what we believe is physiologically beneficial way. Uh, and there, so, so that's one part of the answer. The second part of the answer is that uh, ACC, and I didn't have a chance to put that on, ACC is working towards uh, using algorithms or generating the algorithms that will guide the clinicians and help with the shared decision-making in intensification of the therapies. And now we are beyond the statin therapies. We have therapies of BCSK9, um, We have uh, data on you know, um, omega-3 fatty acids, purified omega-3 fatty acids that also change in plaque compositions. I show the data on a lifestyle changes, exercise and diet. We have growing and or sort of new data on LP little a and 
and growing area of the LP little a treatments, I think all of these will get into the treatment algorithms. Now it will take some time, uh, but we have to have tools to measure that are accurate. And this is what we are probably a little bit talking about. Once we have the tools that can measure at the baseline, can actually accurately measure follow-up, then we can have treatments uh, or have algorithms for the treatments. And this is very, uh, very important. And I, I see Dr. Rumberger here, and I'm, I'm going to quote <laughs> him from Twitter because, you know, he's so active and so great. So sort of deflecting these criticisms like, well, your measurements are not changing the outcomes. And he very eloquently answers that, well, you need to have the measurements and you have to have accurate measurements to actually change the treatments and guide the changes of the treatments. And I think that's what we have to strive for. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think in 20, you know, going in from 2022 to 2023, I mean, we see so much disease. Um, and, you know, we as an imagers and, a, you know, people involved in prevention, you know, ha you know, the inability to measure that is frustrating. And we, we know that if you look at people who have serial CT scans, we often hold them up side by side and say, well, your CAD RAD score is the same or, you know, the plaque kind of looks different, but not having that ability to actually give patients more, more granular data about things like plaque progression response to therapy. You know, where, where, where do they fall with regards to their plaque characterization and risk? Um, I, I think, um, I, I think this, this is, you know, you know, CT compared to functional testing, huge benefit. This is an incremental improvement in our current practice. Okay. I had another question on, can you review, uh, Dr. Valines, the, um, the validation again, uh, in terms of how many sites, what's the plan to do further site validation so that the, uh, data can be from as many sites as possible. For FFRCT using Elucid? Uh, I believe it, uh, maybe you can comment on both plaque validation and FFRCT. Yeah, so, so with regards to FFRCT, so the study I showed you was a multi-site five-center validation. It was, there was one site in Japan and four U.S. sites. Uh, it was using multiple scanners and there were multiple readers. Uh, so inter-reader variability, inter-scanner variability was assessed, um, showing the overall accuracy values that I showed you. Um, that study is based on a single site um, a feasibility study that was published a couple of years ago showing that, in fact, you can use a deep learning-based, plaque-based assessment to accurately estimate invasive FFR, and that was done at MUSC. Uh, I, obviously, additional studies, um, you know, are, are forthcoming with regards to both real-world uh, uh, real world study programs and, uh, and additional studies. Um, as far as the plaque, the study that I showed you, the initial publication in radiology was, uh, was from two sites, two patients. One was an urban site, one was a, a rural site. And as I mentioned, that initial publication uh, was a relatively small study showing feasibility and has since been ex expanded to thousands of samples and thousands of patients uh, at, across multiple different sites. Not all have been published. Most have been uh, with regards to the, the label accuracy that I've shown you and data presented to the FDA. Okay, good. Uh, another question here on um, the relevance and, or, or how perivascular inflammation uh, affects the equation here. Uh, maybe you can comment on that. I mean, I can start, yeah. that's a separate area. And as you can see these, um, the physiology of flow, the plaque, and in my opinion, the perivascular inflammation and how the perivascular fat tissue affect actually to the growth of plaque are all interconnected. And I think there's a great opportunity with again, AI, machine learning, deep learning to provide sort of assessment tools for the clinicians to combine all these data. And I always tell when I read the CTs and, and I tell our, our fellows of residents, it's like, well, there's never plaque when there's no epicardial fat. I mean, if you don't have epicardial fat, you, you will not have plaque. So there's a clear physiologic relationship. And I certainly see that the perivascular fat assessment will have the value. Um, now, there are different tools to use it, and we have to see and look at the data. I think that's not necessarily the topic of this webinar, but the simple answer is yes, I, I'm sure there is a value of perivascular fat, and, and I'll let uh, sort of Todd uh, respond as, as how Elucid is responding to that. And, as, yeah, yeah, I mean, the concept of, of uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a, you know, still practicing clinician, I can tell you that 
you know, extracting the maximal data from clinically performed corner CTs is, is always my goal. And so if we can improve risk prediction using assessments of pure coronary or perivascular adipose tissue, by all means, you know, I do think that if you look at most of the studies to date and you look at relative importance the plots, or if you look at multivariable analysis, that the plaque features still dominate. Um, you know, when you look at overall things. So I think it's going to, you know, you know, I do think that there is incremental added, you know, additional prognostic value in, in pericornal adipose tissue. Um, I do think there is still some work that needs to be done with regards to standardization, particularly given very, very you know, variable ways of measuring what we see in the literature. We know that there's an influence again on uh, vascularity uh, of, of KVP acquisition contrast in the coronaries and its relationship to that. So I do think there needs to be some work. And then, of course, the question is, then how do you treat this? You know, is it colchicine? Is it other therapies? We we simply don't have the data on how to react to it yet. But but absolutely, we're doing work in this space. Um, we have an investigational pericoronary adipose tissue um, analysis that's uh, currently in our research edition. So, but I do think it's an area of active uh, active you know, active investigation as it should be. Okay. And uh, perhaps one final question here, unless others come in, is uh, performance in stented segments. Perhaps you can comment on the software today, our software specifically. Yeah. So the, so the study I showed you was pretty standard. We excluded patients with any type of of prior coronary revascularization. So if you'd had a stent or a bypass surgery, you were excluded from that. Uh, we do know that that's an area that clinicians would like to be able to, we, you know, to perform an FFRCT analysis. And so we are certainly going to do, do those studies. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we agree that that's an area of importance. Um, we, we know that particularly in, in the advancement of scanner technology, there will likely be patients, more patients with stents imaged. And so it will beg the question of doing uh, an FFRCT analysis. Uh, for an assessment of those patients. And so we just need more data. Yeah, I would have a sort of a general statement. I think we where we had the field of coronary CTA was, you know, we evaluate patients with unknown coronary disease or not previously known coronary disease. We evaluate patients that have, you know, perhaps moderate burden of coronary disease. But now we have this growing data, like the ischemia data that I showed, even in ischemia where everybody, where I think the average volume of plaque was on the order of 800 or 900 millimeter cubes, so huge plaque burden. Even in that setting, the CT still provides an excellent uh, predictive value. And I think the field has to respond to that with improving the image quality, improving the scanner technology and analytical tools to analyze these patients. I think we have in the next five, 10 years to bring to our CT labs the patients that we typically didn't want to see. You know, we didn't want to see patients with bypass grafts, the patients with stents. And I think we need to work towards uh, getting those patients to our CT labs. And I hope uh, the technology will bring us there in the next five, 10 years. Yeah, could, could not agree more, Marsh. And it's an exciting time knowing that. And I think that population really speaks to even an, an increased value on quantification and characterization. We're going to see a lot more disease in these patients. You know, many of us have been in labs where we see at least a third to 40% of the patients with no atherosclerosis based on prior uh, practice patterns, um, you know, scanning the very lowest risk patients. And I think um, we're going to see that evolution, as you just said. And I think we've, we've learned that, you know, if you even look at the ischemia trial um, with current generation scanners, we can image patients with known or very high burdens of coronary disease very accurately with current generation scanners. And that's only going to improve. But again, I think that will also beg the question of being, you know, uh, you know, can we, can we leverage deep learning techniques to make our job easier as clinicians? Great. Well, thank you. On behalf of Elucid, we'd like to thank SCCT for sponsoring this webinar. Thank you, Dr. Frenchek and Dr. Valines, and thank you all for your time and attendance today. Have a great rest of the week. Thank you very much. Thank you.